K. Murulidharan, a senior professor of statistics and a Six Sigma quality trainer. Have you noticed that exam scores, body weights and even measurement errors all seems to follow the same pattern or same distribution? And that distribution, that mysterious one is nothing but the normal distribution. In this short video, I will explore how normal distribution facilitates the modeling of large sample subject to chance variations. Look at the contest. See, these are some of the contests which often people make it either directly or indirectly or knowingly or unknowingly. So, many often we say is situation under control, are you normal to do it today or are you normal now, how long will it take to be normal, can we expect a normal delivery, can we expect a normal process, is the patient normal, like this, if you make a statement, many often people make this kind of statements. So, indirectly they are all talking about the normal distribution. So, whatever may be the context, some, everyone is using normal distribution. So, normal distribution is also called bell curve or Gaussian distribution is one of the most important probability distributions in statistics and most widely used and exploited by researchers and decision makers. It describes how values of a variable are distributed. Most values cluster around the mean or average and fewer values cluster or occur as you move further away from either direction. So, this is, that's the reason why we get a hump kind of uh, design. So, that is what is called normal. It's completely balanced or bell-shaped. Okay. So, why is it so important? It is bell-shaped, no doubt, symmetric, zero skewness, etc. Ideal for all decision making because many of our people keep this as the base distribution and accordingly they will see whether there is going to be variation or not. It accounts for controlled variation. It's also called stable distribution or consistent distribution. And of course, it's a quality distribution and a universal distribution per se, characterized by two, me two parameters called mean and standard deviation. And beautifully, they are shown in the mathematical function. F of x is equal to 1 upon root 2 pi sigma e power minus 1 upon 2 sigma square x minus mu whole square. So, x is ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. Even mu is, is also ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, look at the two graphs. So, here if you change the sigma value or the variation or sigma value, then the shape changes. And if you change the target and keep the where sigma value same, then the, the, the graph changes. So, two ways you can uh, perceive the, uh, the curve. Okay, so what is the catch? The distribution of sample mean follows normal distribution, sample median also follows normal distribution, even conditional and marginal and even joint distribution, if the distributions suppose are uh, considered to be normal, then all this become normal. Normal distribution is the foundation of all parametric inferences. And if sampling is done from normal, of course, definitely that is going to be normal only. Even from normal, non-normal population, if you are sampling, you can make it normal by increasing the sample sizes. And T, F, and chi square, the most frequently used statistical tests, are the nothing but the sampling distribution of the normal population. So it's very important to understand how the population and sample behaves. So the population is the sample is small, that means you are approaching to population definitely. Chances of becoming the distribution, normal distribution is very high. So look at this population. So the measures associated with a population, they are called param parameters and the is a measures associated with a sample are nothing but statistics. So, these two important terminology is very important to understand the whole concept of normal distribution. Suppose this is your population, uh, uh, population distribution and the characteristics, population mean, population variance, etc, etc. So similarly, in the same way you can get it. So, if the sample is done appropriately, definitely, it will retain all the characteristics of the population and that should, that kind of sample is considered to be the best. Okay, so the sampling, you will have to give maximum importance. So how are you going to do the sample? And similarly, to, similar to the population characteristics, we have sample characteristics. They are statistics, nothing but. So, X bar, sample is another statistic. Sample variance is another statistics. Okay, so, 
all the, the the population length sample is the basics of uh, basis of all inferential statistics so how do you sample and the you talk about the sample and you uh, then finally make the inference about the population so estimation and hypothesis the two important components of inferential statistics okay so drawing conclusions about large group of individuals that is nothing but population based on a subset that is sample the large group is the study of inference. So when n is very really large, the sample tends to normal population. If a normal distribution is the foundation of all inferential statistics, we have already mentioned it. And sampling is also an integral part of all statistical decision making. So the more the sample, better the conclusion is going to be. If you are slowly and gradually, you will be approaching to the normal distribution. Okay, so in statistics, we generally call all the distributions are the as the populations. And if sampling is do done from normal population, then the distributional sample characteristics will not be normal. But the question is, can you make it normal? So there are plenty of distributions now available for use. Okay, but you can get into a normal distribution by doing some kind of activities like standardization, transformation, even normalization, all will work. But there is no guarantee for uh, that the data will follow normal. So you need to have further transformations, uh, mathematical transformations. One can use it. square transformation, square root transformation, logarithmic transformations, etc., etc. So yes, of course, we can for large samples we can approximate to normal distribution through all these ways. So that's where the importance of central limit theorem comes. So why we need it? Many of the estimators that are used to make inferences about the characteristics of a population are either sums or means of sample measurements. Okay, most of the time we get the data in this form. Or you can convert into a sums or means. Okay, that's always possible and very easy. And uh, mean or average is one of the best measure uh, of accuracy. So yes, is there any distribution of sample means? Yes answer is yes that is where the central limit theorem comes so what you need to do so what you need to do is you generate various samples of various sizes okay for example sample one that's called x1 let that be x1 so you have first sample x11 second sample x12 like that x19 so n numbers of samples are generated like you can go for k sample any so it can be a, a huge set of samples and the compute mean correspond to each sample. Let's say, for example, sample one, the mean is x1 bar, sample two, the mean of x2 bar, etc. etc. Sample k, the mean is x bar. So the question is, what is the distribution of these means? X1 bar, x2 bar, x3 bar, etc. etc. So that's where the uh, uh, we use central limit theorem. So what is central limit theorem? If we have x1, x2, etc., and are as n random variables, any population not necessary to be normal, which are independent and having the same distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then as n tends to infinity and is very large, the sampling distribution of the mean x bar is approximately normally distributed with mean mu and standard deviation sigma by root n, and that we call it as standard error. Technically speaking, we can write it as x bar follows n mu sigma square by n, or x bar minus mu follows n zero sigma square by n, or even you can write x bar minus mu by sigma by root and for n zero bar. So all these uh, expressions are same, it's pointing to the same thing. So as a demonstration, uh, for example, uniform distribution is uh, defined in the interval a to b, and you can generate the sample with uh, as x is equal to a plus b minus a times u. Once you know the value of a and b, you can compute the values of uh, samples. And uh, of course, mean, variance, and all these are completely defined. So another uh, demonstration for exponential distribution. So it's OK. So you can have generate, generate samples from fx 1 by theta e power minus x by theta. Then the corresponding sample generation will be x is equal to minus theta times log 1 minus u. Similarly, if the fx is defined as theta e power minus theta x, then the sample generation is x is equal to minus 1 upon theta log 1 minus u and where u is the uniform random sample okay so what you need to do is generate a huge sample number of sample and uh, and various uh, simulations and uh, plot it 
and see whether it follows exponential distribution or not. So here is the graph. So it will definitely follow the graph. Okay, so central limit theorem is relevant uh, in many sense and many contexts you use uh, this thing. So even rational subgrouping is adopted to minimize the assignable process of variation. So see whether that uh, that kind of uh, uh, manipulation works for with central limit theorem. Of course, it will definitely work. Law of large number is always applied, and the uh, CLT is very much used in machine learning models these days, and even big data concepts because we have huge number of data. So so finding the distribution, and uh, most of the time it will never get into a normal distribution. But using central limit theorem, you can approach to normal distribution and you can make inferences. And sum of variables, say Xn is defined as x1 plus x2 plus Xn uh, can also be approximate to a, a, a normal distribution with some mean and variance. Okay, so Xn approaches infinity, definitely that will work. And here are some another interesting uh, statements of the central limit theorem. And the density of the first one is the density of the sum of two or more independent variables is the convolution of their densities, even though their ex the density is excess. That is, the central limit theorem can be interpreted as a statement about the properties of density functions under convolution. And the convolution of, no, of a number of density functions tends to be the normal density as the number of density functions increases without bound and then it tends to infinity. Second one looks like this. Since the characteristics function of a convolution is the product of the characteristics functions of the densities involved, the central limit theorem has yet another restatement. It's given as the product of the characteristics functions of a number of density functions becomes closer to the characteristics functions of the normal density as the number of density functions increases without bound under certain conditions. Okay, so n tends to infinity, that condition definitely uh, be there, and plus some other conditions also will fall. So, various ways you can perceive the central limit theorem. So, if statistics had a celebrity, it would be the, definitely the normal distribution, always in the spotlight, always photogenic with a perfect bell shape. Thank you very much. We please continue watching my next video on the same name, elucidation, and interpretation. Thank you very much.